Holy cow, we made it. It is week 18, the regular season finale across the NFL for the Jets. That means a trip to Foxborough to take on the Patriots, potentially the last game of Bill Belichick's head coaching career on New England's sideline. Uh, while the Jets season is going to fall short of the playoffs for the 13th straight year, we still have an action-packed regular season finale of Jets class here for you guys that you are not going to want to miss. We're going to look back at the last time the Jets did beat the Patriots, that 2015 season. What was it like covering it? Because I was on the beat way back then. Uh, four downs like we normally do, four quick topics on the Jets, but we're going to kick it off all right here, right now with the takeoff. Well, the Jets season will reluctantly reach its conclusion this weekend in Foxborough. And for the first time since I started covering this team all the way back in 2014, I don't know what fans should be hoping for in terms of a game outcome. On one hand, you want to beat the Patriots. You always want to beat the Patriots. The Jets haven't done it since 2015, and this is an opportunity potentially to end Bill Belichick's reign of terror in the AFC East with a loss to the team that he didn't want to be the head coach of. But if the Jets were to do that, not only would they hurt their own draft position, but they could potentially be handing the Patriots either Caleb Williams or Drake May, and those two could potentially restart New England's run of terror in the AFC East. So I would say, okay, you want to lose to the Patriots, but if you lose to the Patriots, that's losing to New England. This opportunity to potentially go into next year with a little momentum, beat the Patriots, start really your own run in the AFC East, I don't know if you want to do it. Plus, if you're a Jets fan, you can't root for your team to lose, right? I mean, it's just, it's as complicated as it can possibly be uh, for Jet fans. But hey, what would this season be if it wasn't for a little bit more complication? It is time now for Four Downs, and it is presented by Monmouth University. Explore further at monmouth.edu slash amplified. You guys have to know how it works by now. You can probably do this reading for me. It's four topics on the Jets, my thoughts on those topics, and it starts right now with First Down. You guys know me by now. I have no problem at all criticizing the Jets, largely because the Jets make it so easy to criticize the Jets most times. But when it comes to this team's decision to not pursue Joe Flacco when Aaron Rodgers went down, I actually believe that they deserve some leniency from the hate and hysteria that's been bestowed upon them in recent weeks. I uh, take nothing away from what Flacco is accomplishing with Cleveland. It has been spectacular, it's been magical, it's been marvelous. Uh, that's actually the team, and Flacco's a big reason why, that I would love to see go and win the Super Bowl this year, but Flacco's magic, it just wouldn't have been possible uh, with the Jets this season. Not with this play calling, not with the issues across the offense, not with the issues up front. Uh, Flacco was never the most mobile quarterback when he was 23, and, and that mobility has certainly deteriorated as he's gotten older in his career. He can still throw the rock. He was the most impressive thrower of the football in Jets training camp last year, but he would have just been a sitting duck of pinata behind this makeup of this group. So uh, while Jet fans, tip your hat, be happy for Flacco, enjoy what he's doing, uh, know that it wouldn't have been possible here with this team this year. We all know the Jets are going to go out there and try to add a big playmaker this offseason to pair with Garrett Wilson. The two names that we've talked over and over and over about, it has been Devontae Adams if the Raiders decide to make him available via trade, or Mike Evans if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers let him walk out the doors. Uh, there's a third option that I actually like a little bit more than the other two, no matter how much the front office loves Evans or how much Aaron Rodgers loves Adams, and that is Bengals wideout T. Higgins. He is significantly younger than those other two guys. He's only 24. He's been wildly productive as the number two and number three option uh, in Cincinnati, having 1,000-yard seasons in 21 and 22. He's not going to eclipse that this year, but hey, you saw the quarterback issues they're having without Joe Burrow. If the Jets can go out there and get him and add him to this team, not only, again, is he a perfect complement to Garrett Wilson, but you're talking about a guy who is just going to get better and better and better. He is just entering the prime of his career. With Adams and Evans, you don't know when those guys are going to fall off other than they are going to fall off and they're going to fall off soon. So if you have an option or a pick of the litter of those three, if I'm the Jets, you go out there and you get Higgins. I know what I said earlier in the show. How could any Jet fan hope for a Patriots victory on Sunday? Forget what I said. It don't mean bleep now because you absolutely Jet fans need this team to lose to New England. Not only is the thought of Caleb Williams or Drake May quarterbacking the Patriots for the next 10 to 15 years uh, petrifying, but the Jets can so substantially improve their draft stock with a loss 
it is not funny. Right now, they are slated to pick number eight. If they were to beat New England, they could potentially uh, drop as low as number 12. That is not ideal. However, if they lose, coupled with a little bit of help, they could go all the way up to number five or number six. And depending on the run at quarterbacks up in the draft, which you expect to see with, with Williams, May, and Michael Penix as well, who just had a great game against Texas, that's absolutely a position that you want to be in. Here's the key for the Jets to get all the way up there. They need three things to happen. They need the Giants to beat the Eagles, which usually seems asinine, but considering the problems the Eagles are having, they just lost to the Cardinals. Maybe that's not so insane. They need the Chargers to beat the Chiefs. That's one that I don't think is going to happen. But the other one is the Titans beating the floundering, drowning Jaguars. If two of those three things happen and the Jets lose because of their strength of schedule, which is awful weak right now, they could go all the way up to number six. That's where you want to be. So I know, again, you don't want to give Bill Belichick a win to close out his Patriots tenure. Forget that. Think long-term, lose to New England on Sunday. When we talk about the Jets draft class from a year ago, we usually focus on the same three players. It's Garrett Wilson, it's Sauce Gardner, and it's Brees Hall. Uh, it's time, though, that we start giving Jermaine Johnson the same level of praise we give those guys because the Jets' third first-round pick from a year ago, he is having an absolutely dominant season. Six and a half sacks, that is very good considering the opposing offense usually doesn't have to throw the ball against the Jets. 15 quarterback hits, also good for the same reason as those sacks are. But when you look at Johnson analytically, that's where he truly starts to jump off the spreadsheet. He has a pro football focus grade of 83.3. That is very, very good. Uh, his pass rush percentage though, per next gen stats, it is a 12.7. That is the same as Rams all world defensive tackle, Aaron Donald. And it is better than the 12.3 rate that Raiders all world defensive end, Max Crosby has. Uh, Jermaine Johnson, this is a guy who I don't think he gets enough attention. He doesn't get enough praise, but he really could be in consideration for the Jets team MVP award. And he is undeniably uh, in discussion for the Jets in terms of their best overall defensive player. So I started covering the Jets in 2014, but for those first two years, 14 and 15, uh, it was more on a part-time-ish basis because I was still in school at Monmouth University. Shout out Monmouth, sponsor of Four Downs. Uh, but still, of, of those two years, I don't think there was a more memorable game that I covered than the 2015 showdown with the Patriots uh, that ended with Eric Decker's game-winning touchdowns. That season for the Jets, 2015, uh, it, it was, uh, well, statistically, honestly, the, the best that they've had in recent memory. They won 10 games. Uh, but it was during the year up and down, back and forth. You had Gino getting his jaw broken early on, uh, some bad losses early in the year, but then they came back with some good wins. Essentially, they found themselves in a position, I think beginning with that Dallas victory in Dallas where Nick Mangle came by and shook Ryan Fitzpatrick. They controlled their own destiny. If they won out, they were going to be in the playoffs. And I think most people looked at the remainder of their schedule and saw that game against the Patriots at MetLife as the one that was going to make or break their season. Now, as someone who didn't grow up a fan of the Jets, I, I, I'm really probably the last person you wanna ask when it comes to talking about the history of this team. But the one thing that I do know and that I did know back then is that the Patriots always beat the Jets. That was the case ever since they knocked Drew Bledsoe out and began the Brady era. Uh, and it certainly was the case in 2015. So you felt like New England at some way or some point was going to pull this game out. Even when the Jets had the 17-3 lead after Brandon Marshall caught that touchdown, once the Patriots got the field goal, Patriots got another touchdown, Jets made it a seven point game uh, with the Randy Bullock field goal, but then the Patriots scored another touchdown to tie it in the fourth quarter. You felt this one was going to overtime and then New England was going to win. That's just what was going to happen. So we head to overtime and everyone was kind of sitting on pins and needles to for, for the outcome of the coin toss because back then it truly was sudden death and the team that won the coin toss usually won until most recently when they changed the rules. Uh, and, and so when the Patriots won that coin toss, I think everyone in that press box was like, okay, there you go. Tom Brady's going to take him right down the field, get, kick a field goal. They're going to win. Boom, game's over. Uh, to this day, I still can't totally believe what my ears heard, but Bill Belichick chose to kick to begin overtime. Legitimately kick. It, it, it blew my mind where I was like, wait, what? He's, he's, wait, does he know it's sudden death? Like, why are they, like, seriously, they, they chose, they won the coin toss and then they chose to kick off. 
And then you guys know what happens from there. Quincy Ananwa makes that grab on the sideline, breaks a tackle, rushes all the way up there. Brandon Marshall makes another impressive grab to get the Jets close. And then Ryan Fitzpatrick to Eric Decker in the corner of the end zone. Uh, to this day, I don't think I have ever, and this includes when Aaron Rodgers was announced, heard MetLife louder. It was absolute pandemonium. People were going nuts. Decker jumped into the crowd. It truly was a uh, fit doing one of these celebrations. I thought it was Superman at the time. I remember tweeting about it. Uh, but truly, it was one of the most crazy experiences I, I've had covering this team and, and one of the more surreal uh, environments and moments. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys so much for joining. This was a blast as always. If you want to catch all previous episodes of Jets Class, you can. They are available across SNY's digital platforms. That is Facebook, that is X, that is YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, you know the drill by now. Give all of those other Jets Class episodes a like and subscribe to SNY's channel. It just helps us spread to other Jet fans. If you want to see more of me breaking down the Jets along with the rest of the Jets pregame live crew, we are coming your way at 12 o'clock on Sunday. That is 12 p.m. on Sunday before the Jets take on the Patriots. We'll see you there.